It has been a very busy year of travel and uh, getting around different places and all. And uh, very grateful for the opportunity to share God's word as well as the ministry of CE National. And uh, I'm grateful that you're here today. Uh, I was excited this week to do a bit of study and prepare to share some things from God's word. And uh, let's do this. Let's ask the Lord for his blessing upon our time even this morning. God, we're grateful for today. Uh, we're grateful that you are a great God. Uh, and Father, we come to you asking that you would work in our hearts. We ask that your spirit would be unleashed on this place so that you would speak to us through the power of your word. Um, and God, may we hear from you and may we live differently because of it. And we say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I got to be real candid with you and tell you that not all of my travels have necessarily been ministry related. Uh, one thing that our family gets to do once a year is we get to go down to Myrtle Beach and we stay in a place that's about 90 yards from the water and it's great, okay? So you can look up there and see the picture. It's from the balcony. It's wonderful. It's a great relaxing time. It's terrific. Well, while we were there, um, there is... Uh, there is, that's kind of the other direction, there is a grill that is located right next to that big palm tree there on the right. And uh, so I'm watching as we're there, as there's a guy, it's about dinner time, as he is going to light the grill in order to cook his dinner. And uh, what's interesting is, as I'm watching this guy light his grill, uh, is that he's like any typical guy. He's got the charcoal there, and he's got some flames going with the paper, but it's not going fast enough. So he takes the lighter fluid, all right, and he takes it and he squirts it in the top there. And at that point, I turned around and I went inside. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, and it comes back to December 1st, 1979. It comes back to 33 years ago. December 1st, 1979 was a Saturday morning. I remember it for a number of reasons, the first being that I was taking my SATs in order to go to college to play soccer. Let's be honest, the reason I was going to college is to play soccer, not to go to college, all right? Um, it's all good, right? But I had to get a minimum score in order to go ahead and qualify, not have to take any remedial classes. And you might be going, well, didn't you know what you're getting into? Well, I never took any of the prep stuff, and I never took the practice SAT because that was the year before, and I had a soccer game that day, and I chose the soccer game. So I went, took my SATs, half your report, didn't have to take any remedial stuff in school. That was good. Um, and then the real meaning of the day was it was the first soccer game of my high school senior year. Uh, so SATs out of the way. I'm focused on that. Played against a guy. I'm playing sweeper in the back, and this guy's six foot four, and I know that we're going to play at the same school the next year. And uh, I'm happy to be able to tell you that um, he only took three shots the entire day. Uh, bad news is they won 3 nothing as all three went in. Uh, the bad news also is that after the third goal, I thought, I better make friends with this guy if we're going to play together. And um, he then patted me on the head. Um, I wish I could tell you I was filled with the spirit and that I turned the other cheek. Let's just say whatever happened after that, it ended with me patting him on the head, and I'm not proud of it, okay? Um, but after the game, after we lose 3-0, I go home. It's about 5 o'clock in the evening. And I, I walk into our house, and the TV's on. That's a little unusual, because we didn't really have the TV on usually at 5 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. And the other thing that was a little bit unusual is that Alicia, Alicia Ward, my friend and my sister's dearest friend, um, was there in the living room. And you could tell they'd been crying. And it's like, what, what in the world is kind of going on? Because I've been gone all day. And as it turns out, the news was what was on. And it was telling the information about... Um, an explosion at a propane company, and it was Alicia's dad's business. And I guess the way that it works with propane gas, as it's been explained to me, is that when you're preparing the day and bleeding off a tank, you bleed off the propane, and the propane on a cloudy day will kind of stay together in a cloud and move together. On a clear day, it will just kind of dissipate into the air. Well, this was a cloudy day. And in Southern California, this cloudy day, this cloud of propane gas went over and made its way next door to the house to an outdoor water heater and it hit that flame and propane does not so much explode as I've been told as much as it flash burns and Roger Ward um, was caught in that flash fire as well as four of his employees the four other guys were very young and able to hop a fence and roll around on the grass put the flames out but Roger was a big guy well over 300 pounds and there was no way he was getting over that fence and Roger burned over 90% of his body third-degree burns. 
Roger was my youth leader. We are a very small church, and we knew that family exceptionally well. And not a day goes by that I don't think about that situation and that accident. Like I told you, that was 33 years ago. Roger survived for two weeks with his flesh basically burned off until the Lord graciously called him home. And like I told you, he was our youth leader and his kids were our friends. So there is something about when you light a campfire or when you light a grill or deal with anything electrical that I will typically just step away or back off and I'll leave. See, every person who does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior is destined to separation from him forever. And the scripture is really clear that that separation from God also involves an eternal torment where the fire does not go out. And that bothers me. I think about that every single day. And sometimes I think of that as a blessing. And sometimes I think of that as a curse. What is it that reminds you about the eternal nature of man? Um, maybe you can explain a, a similar circumstance. Uh, maybe for you, if you're honest, you don't think about it much at all. Uh, maybe for you it was earlier in the year and that horrible shooting that was in Sandy Hook in the Northeast. Maybe for you it was this week and it was Boston and all that went on there that you begin to think a little bit more about the eternal nature of man. I have no doubt that if while we were meeting here today, if we found out that there was a fire right over here at one of the houses, that we would just stop what we were doing. We would all rush over, do whatever we could to make sure that we got anybody out that might be trapped there. I believe we would willfully stop what we're doing and go do that. We see the physical, but the spiritual and the eternal truth is just as real. And can I even say it this way? It is even more real. Well, I believe that God's word has a lot to say about the eternal. And uh, I want to look at a passage of scripture this morning that I hope makes a difference in your life as well as mine. If you would, would you grab your Bible and turn to the book of Jonah in the Old Testament? Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. And we're going to read those 10 verses together. And in reverence to the word of God, would you please stand with me? As we read this passage, Jonah chapter 3, 1 to 10, as we read it aloud. Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. And he issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we shall not perish? When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Father, we come to you today asking that your word would make a difference in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as you look at those first four verses of chapter 3, you find out that Jonah has actually repented of what kind of is the famous story in the book of Jonah. We know that he was supposed to go to these people, and he went the opposite direction. We know about the story even from days of yore when we were small, in Sunday school, etc. We know that a great fish came and swallowed him. He repented and eventually got puked onto dry land. Because of his repentance, God says, all right, round two. 
And he basically gives him the same command in chapter 3 as he did in chapter 1, but because Jonah has a repentant heart, he listens to God and does what it is that God wants him to do. What God tells him is that he should tell this city that they are going to be under condemnation. Now, this city of Nineveh, it describes in the passage as being an exceedingly great city. It's probably the largest city in the known world at that time. It took 1.4 million workers over eight years to build the city walls. And those walls were about 100 feet tall, about 10 stories high. And research tells us that they were thick enough that at the top of them, three coaches could all pass each other at the same time. So a pretty wide wall. There were towers that went around this city of about 60 miles, and there were 1,500 of them, and those towers stood about 20 stories or 200 feet tall. It was quite an amazing thing. And to walk all the way around the city was a three days journey, which was 60 miles. It was a large place, a little bit larger than Rittman, a lot larger than when on Lake Indiana. The message that God told Jonah to speak to these people of Nineveh was very simple. It was simply repent to God or in 40 days this city will be overthrown. Now the interesting thing about that phrase that this city will be overthrown is that we think, okay, somebody else will take over, it'll be conquered, it might be tough. But these folks understood from the meaning of the word overthrown, it was this exact same word that is used to what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah where it was destroyed with fire and brimstone. We know that by looking in the book of Genesis, by looking in Lamentations, and also the book of Amos, those books in the Old Testament. So when it was said that you repent or you will be destroyed, you will be utterly destroyed, these people understood this exceptionally well. Well, we then come to verses 5 through 9, and we come to the main point of what we want to talk about this morning. If there's only one thing that you get this morning from this time in Jonah chapter 3, this is it, okay? If you want to put it on auto, autopilot, just cruise the rest of the time, that's totally fine. But get this point. Here it is. Man's repenting and God's relenting always go together. Let me say it again. Man's repenting and God's relenting always go together. Turn to the person next to you and say, repenting and relenting go together. Go ahead. Tell them that right now. Go ahead. Repenting and relenting. Turn to the person on the other side of you and say, you need to listen to this because God's repenting, or man's repenting and God's relenting always go together. Yes, good. Some of you did that. That's great. Repenting and relenting always go together. Some of you are kinesthetic learners, meaning that you learn best by doing. Well, let me give you some hand motions. Not that this is junior church, but just to help us remember this main fact, okay? When man repents, again, when you bow down, when you give authority to God, when man repents, what does God do? God relents. So would you do that with me? When man repents, God relents. Turn to the person first you talk to and say, you need to pay attention to this. This is good stuff, all right? Very good. Well, what is it that repentance is all about? Well, here's what one commentator said. The word repentance is not actually used in the passage. But repentance is not really a word. It is something that you do, and these people did repent. Man's repenting leads to God's relenting. Well, what is repentance? Repentance is a change of heart and mind over old ways of living. A change of heart and mind over old ways of living. It is going one direction with life and then realizing you're wrong and turning the exact opposite direction, 180 degrees and going the exact opposite way in obedience to God. It's the exact opposite of pride is the idea of repenting to God. I always have to laugh because my dad was a, a great preacher and uh, and yet he was mathematically challenged. He was also challenged at being able to do construction and those kind of things. So it's just kind of funny. He would always talk about this, that if you are repenting, that God wants you to turn 360 degrees. And I'm thinking, that's our problem. We end up going back the same direction, and God wants us to go the other way. It's a 180-degree turn because it's a change over heart and a change of mind over old ways of living. Well, verse 5 tells us that these people believed in God. It was kind of what Jonah dreaded in Jonah chapter 1, that he didn't want them to repent, but they did. But it says that they, re that they believed in God, but it doesn't stop there. It involves that they did something to show that they were repentant. 
And that's sackcloth and ashes. We don't do that in our society this day. But back in that generation and that day, sackcloth was a garment basically made out of goat hair, not a very comfortable thing at all. And ashes was just an outward sign of mourning. And you see that the people repented and that they donned this apparel and sat in ashes to show that they were repentant. And in verse 8, it says that even the king does this public mourning of sackcloth and ashes. And it kind of reminds us of the book of James in the New Testament where it says, God is no respecter of persons. Everyone must give an account before God from the least to the greatest, even the king. Some of you are going, well, okay, what does this have to do with each other of repentance on the inside and then showing something on the outside? Uh, I'm sorry that Dana can't be with me on this trip. You would like Dana a lot more than you like me. I'm not offended by that. It's just the truth. But the reality is, is that if I say that I love my wife, that is a good thing. It's a great thing. But the reality is, is that had better be the start of it, not the end of it. Because we know that our actions had better match our words. So if I say that I love my wife Dana, then my actions had better demonstrate that I love her by the way that I listen to her, that I help her. Whatever it is, my actions had better back up my words. I think that's the suggestion of Jonah chapter 3, that the people repent and then they do something about it to show that they've actually repented. It kind of reminds me of this idea from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that there's an inside decision, but there was an outward display, and this is what the Apostle Paul actually talks about. Would you even read this verse with me, please? If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So there is something that happens on the inside, but something happens on the outside because of that inside conviction. Well, what is it that God does with a repenting heart? Well, let's look at his response in verse 10. Follow along in verse 10 where it says, When God saw their deeds, what they did because of that internal change, that they turned from their wicked way. Then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Well, this is not an abnormality from God. This is consistent with his character. In fact, the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah said it this way, at one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot or pull down or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring upon it. See, God relented when there was a repentant spirit and he shows himself again and again to be a gracious and to be a merciful God. He is one who is not willing that any should perish, and he ends up sparing this great country, this great city of Nineveh. Not only that, but he keeps his word. He keeps his word both physically and spiritually to this generation of Nineveh. And the Old Testament prophet Nahum tells us that for 150 years, nothing happened in Nineveh. See, repenting and God's relenting always go together. It reminds us of that passage in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and I bet you know it. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a truth in the Old Testament scriptures. It is a truth in the New Testament scriptures. Some of you would know my boss, Ed Lewis. I joked around in our Sunday school class time today that if you've not met Ed, he is a quiet, unassuming man. Um, and, well, obviously he is not. Ed loves the Lord, and it just pours out of him. Uh, Ed, Ed's probably favorite speaker to listen to is a pastor in Washington, D.C. area, uh, a man by the name of Lon Solomon. And Lon Solomon is a Jewish man that loves the Lord. He's a great preacher. In the middle of every sermon that Lon Solomon preaches, he tells his congregation, all right. Now it's time for our favorite time. Here it comes. On the count of three. Everybody ready? One, two, three. And everybody yells, so what? Because, yeah, that's the truth of the scripture. But Lon Solomon is trying to get across, okay, that's the truth of the scripture. What does it have to do with the way that you live and the way that I live? I think that's a pretty good question. So 
On the count of three, guess what you get to yell? Yeah, you got it. Ready? One, two, three. So what? Well, let me tell you. All right? What does this mean to you and me? Well, if we say that we are followers of Jesus Christ, how do people actually know that? See, there are a lot of good people in the world who are apart from Christ. Have we ever actually told them about the relationship that we may have with the Lord Jesus as personal Lord and Savior? That bothers me that some folks just think we're good people. No, if we have a relationship with Jesus, we're changed people, and we need to verbalize that faith in Christ. Maybe for you, a good step is baptism. Now, some of you are going, baptism? Where in the world is that? It's not there. <laughs> but I'll tell you what is there is this concept that there can be an open declaration that we follow Jesus, and baptism gives us the opportunity to publicly say, I believe in Jesus and I'm following him with my life. Just in January, I had the opportunity to baptize my 72-year-old mother-in-law, as well as, at the very same time, my 16-year-old son. It was a great day. And let me tell you why. If you ever get to dunk your mother-in-law three times and get away with it, it's a wonderful thing. It's a great day. I'm kidding. But I'm not. Uh, my mother-in-law has known about Jesus her whole life, and when she was just a young teen, she decided that she would be baptized for an open declaration that she was following Jesus with her life. But she is deathly afraid of water. And so she got baptized when no one was around with the preacher on a Saturday because she was embarrassed because she might freak out going underneath the water. At 72 years of age, she told me, I'm tired of people thinking, me worrying about what people think. I want to openly declare that I love Jesus and I want to be baptized. And I got to dunk my mother-in-law three times so that she could say, I'm a follower of Jesus. It was a great day. And then to be able to take her grandson and do the exact same thing because he openly wanted to declare that he is a follower of Jesus. That was a special time. Some people will say, yeah, but religious stuff is kind of personal. I'll just keep it to myself. Well, I'm not the one you have to convince of that. It was the Apostle Paul who said, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. So what is it that you have believed? Have you believed in the truth in your heart that Jesus, the God-man, came to earth and lived a perfect life? And yet he was put on the cross, he was crucified there for the wrong that you, the wrong that I have ever done, am doing, or ever will do. He paid the penalty and when he died there, he said, it's finished. They put him in a grave. And three days later, he rose again. For 40 days, he walked the earth as an open testimony. And then he ascended up into heaven on high. And he now sits on the right hand of the Father. Have you ever said, I believe that, and I receive that free gift of salvation? If that's your story, that's a wonderful thing. But let me ask, according to Romans chapter 10, have you ever confessed that with any, to anybody with your mouth that that is what I believe? That's a wonderful thing because it's a testimony of what you actually believe on the inside coming out on the outside. Some of you might be listening to this story about Jonah chapter 3 and going, well, there are messed up people in Nineveh. Yeah, there are a lot of messed up people in this world too. Some of them we know. Some of them we just hear about or read about. And we might think, I wish that there was a modern day Jonah. I wish there was a modern day Jonah. I agree. I do wish there was a modern day Jonah. But then I think about what Jesus actually said right before he ascended up into heaven. And he's the one who said, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, end of the world. See, there are modern day Jonas. At least there are supposed to be modern day Jonas. The modern day Jonas are to be you and me. There's so many ways that we can talk with people about Jesus. It is not about a presentation. It is about a conversation. I think sometimes we get scared and freak out to think that I've got to know everything to say when it just involves starting a conversation. One of my favorite questions as I just get to engage with people is to ask the question, so what do you think happens after you take your final breath? It's a question. It's a conversation starter. Sometimes people don't want to talk about that, and you know what you say? Yeah, we won't talk about it then. That's okay. 
But other times, there's opportunity to talk about those things. See, there is a 100% mortality rate, but many times, we don't want to think about it or talk about it, but the reality is, there's a 100% mortality rate for everyone. Another way that you can engage in some kind of conversation with someone is to give them a book. I carry around a book by a guy by the name of Mark Kao. He's been at our youth conference at Momentum. Mark played basketball with Charles Barkley at Auburn. He's six foot nine. People confuse us all the time as twins. It's embarrassing. But I will tell you, Mark has a passion for reaching people for Jesus to start that conversation. And he's written some books. So when I travel on an airplane, I probably do that three, four times a year maybe. Um, I carry one of his books with me. And it's just a, a neat thing is, hey, a friend of mine wrote this book. Would you be interested in this? I have people thanking me going, have you read it? Isn't it your book? Don't you want to keep it? No, Mark gives these to me, and, and he gladly lets me give them away. And it talks about things that are about people's eternity. And the last conversation I had when I was heading out to California, I sat next to a gal. She's probably close to 30. She's an ad executive for Pepsi. And uh, it was, she was one who worked on the Pepsi Cola Super Bowl stuff. And she goes, I work 24-7. She goes, I am always working. And even as soon as she planes land, she's working, pulling out stuff. And she says to me during the flight, she goes, I've started to wonder if there isn't more to life than just my career. I just bought a condo with my boyfriend. And I really am starting to wonder, is there more than just being a successful ad agent with a successful company? And I said, funny you should talk about that because there's a 100% mortality rate. And at the end, are we going to look back and go, I invested in what was worth it. Here's a friend of mine. It was a wonderful, and you know what? She goes, thanks. This is great. Now, what's God going to do with that? I have no idea. But I got to be a part of it, and it was a blast. It was fun. She was a sweet gal. I think about things like this, and we say, well, I don't know all the answers, but if you're a follower of Jesus, you've got your story to tell, and nobody can argue with the evidence of a changed life. Something I've been able to do recently with some folks is even just ask them. I'll tell you what happened to us. I was in Philly with a group of Grace College students over at Urban Hope in Philadelphia. And we went to the Cambodian section. And we were just going to be there for an hour and a half, two hours, just meeting people from different cultures and seeing if any spiritual conversations could come up or if we could pray with people. Walked into a dress shop, met a gal about 20 years of age, sweet gal, wonderfully kind. Uh, another student and then myself were talking with her for the longest time that they'd come over from Cambodia. Her mom owned a dress shop. Her dad owned a bar a few blocks away. They were very driven to be successful in the United States, and they worked hard. And, I, you know, as you walk in, there's like this little setup where there's fruit being offered to their God right there. And so I said, now, would you consider yourself to be Buddhist? And she said, well, yes, yes, we would as a family. We go once a year and give gifts to the priests and things. So yes, I said, has anybody told you as you've come to America in the last couple of years that, you know, there are some principles, some founding principles about our country that are found in the Bible? Has anybody ever told you what the Bible is all about or the message of the Bible? And she goes, no. I said, would you be interested in me taking 30 seconds to tell you what it says? She said, yeah, I'd like to hear that. And so I basically just got to explain that Jesus created the world, the problems of sin, he came, he died, and the salvation message. And I said, and that's what the Bible is all about. And she said, huh. I said, have you ever heard that before? No, I've never heard any of that before. Now, was she going to change and repent and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior right then and there? No. But it's a first step. I have no idea what other believers are going to walk into her shop, engage with her at the school. She's going, I don't know. But sure, it's fun to be involved in that process. See, here's the deal. If we do not proclaim hope and truth that's found in Jesus, then we're going to be lacking in our own personal lives. Philemon, verse 6 says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you may have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Interesting because when we think about the idea of talking about Jesus, we usually think that it's going to be good for that other person, and it is. But that is not what Philemon verse 6 says. Philemon verse 6 says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you may have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. We come to full maturity when we verbalize our faith in Christ. Don't tell me somebody is, is mature in their faith because they know a lot about the book. Well, that's a good starting spot, but what do we do to identify with Jesus? Because full maturity comes when we verbalize our faith, according to Philemon, verse 6. That's a challenge for me. It may be a challenge for you as well. 
Here's the thing, though. If we are going to live like Jonah did in Jonah chapter 3 and walk in obedience like Matthew chapter 28, then it's going to get a little bit messy. And let's be candid, sometimes we're uncomfortable with messy. See, most of the time, we don't like to talk to people that we don't know. Well, can I just kindly say it's time for us to get over that? <laughs> I have a friend who's a junior high pastor down in, towards the Columbus area. And uh, he's been getting a little bit of flack because he continues to reach out and his students continue to reach out to students that don't know Jesus. And when they show up, they look like they don't know Jesus. Do you know why they look like they don't know Jesus? It's because they don't know Jesus, okay? And he's getting a little bit of flack from maybe some of the church people because some of them are more interested in the outward appearance than they are about some of these children's hearts. He was telling me a story about a, a middle schooler who came to church with him on a Sunday morning. And this is a church of about 800, 400 in the first service, 400 in the second. And he's sitting there listening to Gary preach, and this kid is next to him. And uh, every good Christian knows you turn your cell phone off when you come in the sanctuary, right? Well, this middle school kid has never been to church before in his life. It's the first time he has ever been to any church, anything. And he's sitting there with my friend. And all of a sudden, while Gary's preaching, you know what happens? His phone goes off. So what does he do? He picks it up and says, hello? This is while the service is going on. The pastor is preaching his sermon. And my friend, my friend looks and goes, dude, dude, you might want to take that outside. And the kid goes, okay, yeah, yeah. And he's just having the conversation as he's on the way out to the foyer. Are you offended by that a little bit? I got to admit to you, I'm a little uncomfortable. I am. But when I know the full story, that I find out that it's actually the kid's dad who's calling him. Parents are divorced. He never sees his dad, rarely has contact with him. This is a hurting kid that is looking for answers and meanings in all kinds of ways, whether that be Jesus or otherwise right now. And when he sees that it's his dad calling, you bet he's going to answer that phone and he wants to talk to his dad. Does that change your attitude at all towards this young boy? You know what I realize? I realize that I'm judgmental and that I need to be a lot more full of grace to this kid in this kind of a situation. Another student, middle schooler. Middle schoolers are the best because they'll tell you what they're thinking whether you ask or not, you know? You're speaking to them like this retreat this weekend I was at. Middle schooler, this is boring. Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> they will tell you what they're thinking whether you want to know or not. I live with that. I can live with that. That's great. But asking a middle schooler, um, so what do you know about Jesus? Uh, didn't they hang him and put him in a cave? No. No understanding at all about the truth of the gospel. There's a lady at Urban Hope, and she's always embarrassed when we tell this story, but it explains that there are folks who know little about God, little about the scriptures. She was talking with Ed, and she says, yeah, this week I need to go, and I need to buy two books from the bookstore. And he said, really? What? What, what are you talking about? She goes, I need to go buy the Gospel of John and I need to go buy the Gospel of Matthew. And Ed says, um, those are two books in the Bible. She goes, no, no, they told us we need to go buy two books. And so I'm going to go buy two books, Gospel of John, Gospel of Matthew. And he goes, no, no, those are two of the 66 books that are in the Bible. And she goes, they are? Why do they call them books in the Bible? He goes, well, that's just what they call them. And she goes, now, I've seen there in there, there's like, Big numbers and little numbers. What are the big numbers? We call those chapters. And what are those little numbers? We call those verse. No understanding of anything of how a Bible's put together. There are folks around us all over, and they just aren't in Philadelphia, and they aren't just kids. They're everywhere, and people need to know Jesus. But it gets messy, and it gets uncomfortable. And if we're going to be obedient Jonas, we're going to have to learn to be a little bit less comfortable and we're going to have to be ones who don't always get our preferences. And we're going to have to learn to love the messes. Here's the problem, though. The problem is, is that the older I get, the more I expect comfort and I expect to get my way. And that's just wrong because it's not about me. I'm sure that Nineveh was not a really pretty place when these people began their walk with God. Because there's a whole lot in salvation of justification and sanctification. And that sanctification process of becoming more like Jesus can get really messy. It can get really messy. 
Well, let's continue on talking about this idea and ask ourselves some really pointed questions. In fact, in your bulletin, there is even a little sheet that if you want to, you can pull that out and you can answer them there or you can just do it in your heart and your mind as we look at them. Here's the first question to ask ourselves. Number one, have I believed in my heart that Jesus is the Christ and that he is my personal savior? That's either a yes or a no. If it's a no, it could be today is your day of salvation. But have you believed in your heart that Jesus is the Christ and he is my personal savior? Second question that follows right after that, have I confessed with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord? That's a very important step according to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. How do you respond to that? Here's the third question. We went over this in Sunday school from Luke chapter 10 and saw that people that did ministry and identify with Jesus, that their lives are characterized by joy and power. Is your life characterized by joy and by power? Here's a fourth question to ask ourselves as we think about Jonah chapter 3. Which Jonah am I? Am I the Jonah in Jonah chapter 1 where I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm going to do what I want to do? Or am I the Jonah in Jonah chapter 3 that after God gets my attention, I'm actually going to do what it is that he wants me to do? In this case, as we've been talking, to tell people about Jesus. Here's the last question just to think about would be this. Who is it that is my Nineveh? Who is one person that you know who needs to know about the salvation that's offered through Jesus, about repentance, about God and his willingness to relent? Who is it that needs to know that? Maybe you're saying that you need some help, and that's exactly why you have church leadership here, is to help you in that process, maybe of believing and confessing with your mouth, or it's the idea of lovingly how to bring that up in conversation with your friends. If you want help in that, you can turn this card in in the back as we're dismissed. That would be great. For me personally, you've heard that I like soccer stuff just a little bit. So I do a lot more refereeing than I do coaching because it can fit my schedule a little bit better. And you know what I've been able to do is I've been able to ref men's indoor soccer. And if you ever want to see the fallen nature of man, all you do is get a group of guys and throw a ball into the middle of it, and you'll see it expressed real quickly. If you really want to see it quickly, you take old guys who think they're young guys and you throw a ball in the middle of it and it becomes very obvious. But the huge majority of those guys that I ref on Wednesday nights do not know Jesus and I spend time with them and it's good for me to be uncomfortable, to be about, around people where the language is pretty salty, where it's difficult and I'm building relationships with those guys. Found out that one guy who heads up the program because of conversation is a follower of Jesus. What does that mean we can do in partnership? I don't know, but I'm excited to find out. Well, what would happen if we all lived like Jonah in Jonah chapter 3? And let's wrap up with this. Well, I think that we're going to have peace because we're obedient and living on mission. 2 Corinthians 5.15 is a CE national verse. We've adopted it, and it says, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised on their behalf. Here's another thing. If we all did this corporately, I think that we would all live with joy and with power. Luke chapter 10. I think we would see people follow after Jesus with their lives. And I think that we would have an eternal rather than a temporary focus. I also think that our churches would become energized because there are stories of people coming to Christ in crazy, wonderful, miraculous ways that only God can explain. Here's the other reality that I think that if we live this way is that we're going to attract messy people. We're going to attract people who are different from us in a lot of ways. We're going to attract people who are different from us politically, different from us culturally, from a different educational background. They're going to come to church wearing different clothing, liking different kinds of music. I'm sure that these were kinds of issues they faced in Nineveh that many years ago. And I know they were issues that were faced in the New Testament church. If you don't believe me, look at Acts chapter 15, when you've got it going from a Jewish situation saying, all these Gentiles are believing, how do we work as the body of Christ? And they only land on two things. Be careful what you eat around your Jewish brothers. And the other is abstain from sexual immorality. That's it. I think that I would have come up with a whole lot bigger list 
but the grace of God is on display in these messy situations. And they only come up with two things. Pretty incredible. Here's the last thing, I think. I think that we truly will mature in our faith to become more like Jesus because it's not just about knowing more. It's about being more in our character due to our obedience. There's life change, and our preferences will fade, and others will be a whole lot more important than ourselves. Our temporary feelings of being uncomfortable are going to pale by comparison with the joy of being obedient to God. And Jonah found this out, but he sure found it out the hard way. Repenting and relenting. Ours and others repenting and God's relenting always go together. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for an Old Testament story. But God, there are truths of the scripture all the way through it that when anyone repents and says, I want to follow Jesus, that God, you relent. And you say, I will not bring calamity, but I will bring relationship and I will bring hope. And Father, I pray that if there's anybody here today that personally needs to believe and confess with their mouth, I pray that today would be that day of salvation. Father, for others of us, we know people that need to know this good news. And I pray, God, that we would be active in being vocal about our faith. Give us opportunities. Give us boldness to talk, to have conversations. Help us to use words about church and Bible and prayer. And, Father, help us to engage with people about things that really matter. God, I'm reminded that even Jonah in the last chapter got his eyes focused on wrong things even after he was doing the right things. God, maybe in this room there are some of us that have done this right, but God, we've lost our first love. Bring us back, God. Help us to experience the joy personally as we see others repent and then you relent. And we'll say thanks for it. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.